The history of slavery and the discussion about race has been to some degree weaponized in a way that's made us more polarized rather than less. Now, we can wave that to one side, saying, look, we all agree that slavery was bad, but it's time to move on. And I have done that. But we should know the history, even if we're not going to let ourselves be defined by it. So what is the story behind Britain and black slavery? What can we learn from it? This is about the history of what actually happened. Understanding the past, not moralising about it or passing judgement. Because judging the people of an era because the accepted norms of the time don't match the accepted norms of your group in the current time, well, it's about as useful as judging wild animals for eating each other. So with that said, let's jump in. We were colonised long before we became colonisers, and the Roman Empire was the earliest multinational force that brought people from its African provinces to Britain. Those Afro-Romans turned up in the 3rd century AD, something like a thousand years before the first English sailors reached sub-Saharan Africa. There was a group of them in the north of England. We know this because of a Roman inscription in Cumbria. We said that a unit of Aurelian Moors had been stationed there. The Aurelian Moors came from what is now Libya, Tunisia and Algeria. 200 skulls, excavated from an archaeological site in York, found a group that was of mixed ethnic origin. And given that they were found in both the poor area and the wealthier area, showed that those of African origin had moved in all levels of society. The pathways that led them to the British Isles disappeared with the collapse of the Roman Empire. In the 7th century, the rise of Islam broadened the gulf between Africa and Europe, and for the next thousand years, contact was significantly more constrained. All sorts of myths came to be believed about what was in Africa by people in England. People believed that there was a secret black Christian kingdom in the heart of Africa on the other side of the Islamic world, but led by someone called Prester John. And the Crusaders dreamed of forming an alliance with his distant king to finally triumph in the Holy Wars. Well, that didn't happen. But what really drew the Europeans in later centuries was, of course, not that but African gold. Portuguese traders were the first to benefit, and others, including the British, decided that they fancied a slice of that action. Unfortunately for them, the Pope issued a papal bull, an edict that granted Portugal exclusive trading rights along the African coastline. Well, that obstacle came to an end when King Henry VIII was excommunicated when he married Anne Boleyn in 1534. The first English expedition to the African coast to break the Portuguese monopoly was sent, led by Thomas Wyndham. The ship made it back to Plymouth with just 40 men left after Wyndham and most of the others had been killed by tropical diseases. But nevertheless, the trip made a handsome profit for investors. So that's all right then. A second expedition came back with a similar bounty of ivory and pepper and gold, but also brought back five black men who had been recruited to act as translators for future expeditions. And the recruitment of those men who studied English in London and went back with subsequent missions highlighted the key aspect of this time. The relationship between the Europeans and the Africans was that of traders, not colonisers. The mental image people have now of the British in Africa and the so-called scramble for Africa of the late 19th century, none of that was how it started. By the time the English got into this, West Africans had been trading with the Portuguese for several generations. They knew the value of what they had to trade. They were not naive to attempt to swindle them. They saw themselves as equal trading partners. And at that point, it couldn't have been much different because the geography of the coastline and the natural barrier of the inland forest was almost purpose designed to fend off would-be colonisers. And those that tried would get ravaged by tropical diseases and those were obstacles that were, at that time, impossible to overcome. By the 16th century, black people were starting to take residence in the British Isles, mainly in London and around the seaports of the south. The historical record is scant, but they seem to have lived ordinary lives, marrying and raising families. The majority were in domestic service, 
they don't appear to have been enslaved. And let's note something about slavery quickly at this point. There were slaves across the 15th and 16th century Europe. These were drawn from various races. At this point, there was no particular link between slavery and the people of Africa. Rather, if you were conquered, you were enslaved. If you were intercepted by pirates, you could be likewise. When Rule Britannia, the song, was written with the words Britons never shall be slaves, it was with a view to the fact that former slaves with the Roman Empire, but particularly also that Britons were being enslaved by Barbary pirates. So black Britons were not slaves at that point. They were mostly poor. A few managed to reach greater respectability. For instance, John Blank appears in records in 1509 when he was a member of the court of King Henry VIII. His presence was recorded in the Westminster Tournament Roll. More black people appeared in coming decades, some of whom were free, a few of whom were slaves brought to Britain from elsewhere. The first sign that the latter might be in legally ambiguous territory came in 1587. Hector Nunez, a Spaniard living in England, filed a complaint in court that he'd purchased a slave, brought him to England, and yet, astonishingly, he was unwilling to recognise his enslavement and to serve as such. To Nunez's disappointment, he found that English common law gave him no remedy. And that ambiguity in law became part of an ongoing saga in what was to follow. Until then, Britain had very little involvement with the slave trade and no permanent colonies in the New World. The lever that changed all that was sugar. Initially, Barbados was settled and developed by Britain using white indentured servants and a small number of imported Africans to produce sugar. Incidentally, Britain's colony in Virginia, America, likewise had its tobacco plantations largely run with indentured labour. Indentured servitude was akin to slavery in terms of how people were treated, but it was a set period between seven and nine years, at the end of which they could go free, at least in theory. In frontier societies, many of them didn't necessarily survive their period of service, terms of contracts were often not honoured and so on. Lots of bad stories. But then labour became more scarce in England, after the Civil War and the supply of indentured servants for the colonies dried up. Having established an economic engine that needed cheap labour, they ended up shifting to the use of slaves from Africa. By 1680, there were 38,000 slaves on Barbados. By the end of the century, there were 50,000. The Barbados Slave Code was drawn up to formalise slavery as legally sanctioned. And critically, the code drew clear distinctions between white servants and Negro slaves. In fact, it used the terms Negro and slave interchangeably. Historian David Olusoga noted, to be black on Barbados was to be a slave. The slave code denounced black people as heathenish, brutish and an uncertain, dangerous pride of people. Because, of course, how could you legitimise slavery in a code unless you can define the people you're dealing with as somewhat lesser, unsuited for anything better? Indentured servants, despite all the abuse they suffered, remained under the protection of English common law. They had the right to trial by jury. The slave code denied such rights to black people. And this was as much of a pragmatic thing on the part of the planters, not because they were sentimental about the poor whites or that they were focused on what people today would call white supremacy. Alusaga again. The planters who had long held the white poor in deep disdain, especially Irish indentured servants and the convict labourers, understood that white racial unity was an insurance policy that might protect them in the event of a slave rebellion. And the outcome from that was that after a period of a thousand years where people had been seen in all of their significant diversity, the Atlantic slave trade, developing from that initial code, began to define widely differing cultures and ethnic groups as Negroes, and all Europeans, regardless of their ethnic and social background, into a new category of white. The whole way of talking about people in those terms is a legacy of that situation and that period. 
The monarchy was restored in 1660, Charles II was put on the throne, and he established the Joint Stock Company to pursue the African slave trade. It became the Royal African Company, which held the royal monopoly and became responsible for transporting and enslaving more Africans than any other company in history. Within a decade of its creation, England's share of the Atlantic trade went from 33% to 74% at the expense mainly of the Dutch and the French. The monopoly lasted a while, but like in all situations, the company became big and inefficient and tyrannical, and eventually it failed to be able to meet rising demand, so the royal monopoly was abandoned in 1712. Independent traders could then swarm over the shores of West Africa, and the scale of the trade went upwards significantly. At the same time, a side effect was that hundreds and then thousands of black people arrived in Britain as free people and also a number as slaves. Even though some black people were able to freely move around British society and assimilate, the truth is that some Africans lived and died as slaves in Britain, even though their lives were significantly better than those living in the full brutality of plantation slavery. Occasional adverts of slaves for sale appeared in newspapers. Slaves were sold by art dealers, for whom it appears to have been a profitable sideline. Young enslaved children were acquired by wealthy families and displayed as fashionable accessories by great ladies. One such appeared in William Hogarth's satirical series, A Harlot's Progress. The challenge for slave owners was that Britain was not a country where slavery was normalised. An article in 1764 in The Gentleman's Magazine put it like this. The main objections to their importation is that they cease to consider themselves as slaves in this free country. Nor will they put up with the inequality of treatment, nor more willingly perform the laborious offices of servitude than our own people. And if such slaves escaped, there isn't a record that runaway black servants were held in great hostility by the general population, so it became relatively easy for slaves to escape and to become free. That wasn't the end of their troubles if they succeeded, because Britain's flawed poor law system, which was based on people who'd fallen on hard times, returning to the parish of their birth to receive charity, that wasn't designed to support people in their position. So one of the places you'd often see black faces was among the homeless of the streets. In the winter of 1765, a first domino in a long chain was pushed over by a lawyer called David Lyle, who in a fury for some reason savagely beat his young slave Jonathan Strong, threw him out onto the street, his face a mess of open wounds, no doubt expecting he was going to die. Jonathan turned up at the surgery of a doctor called William Sharp, who once a week tended to the problems of the destitute. Strong was spotted in the queue by the doctor's brother, Granville Sharp. The boy seemed ready to die, he wrote later. Urgent medical attention saved him. As he recovered, the Sharps paid him to work for them as a messenger. He was then spotted on the street by Lyle, who, seeing him recovered, decided he wanted to reassert his ownership of a young man to make some money by having him shipped to the West Indies. It went to court, and it was an open question how the court was going to view this. Was this a man who, despite having committed no crime, had been kidnapped and imprisoned? Or was this an item of property who had been stolen from his legal owner by Granville Sharp? The conclusion was the former, and he was freed. And this was a radicalising moment for Granville Sharp, and he became the foremost activist against slavery, and he began studying the jumble of law that existed at that point. And he found helpful precedents and also unhelpful ones. In 1701, Lord Chief Justice Holt had ruled in the case of Smith versus Brown and Cooper. One party had sued the other when they refused to pay him for a slave that had been brought to London. Holt threw the case out and said this, as soon as a Negro comes into England, he becomes free. Such judgments horrified the planters who felt that their property rights were being undermined. They were given heart in 1729 when a group of them petitioned the Attorney General, Sir Philip York, for an opinion. At a dinner they were told what they wanted to hear. 
a slave coming from the West Indies to Great Britain or Ireland, with or without his master, doth not become free. And that seemed to put slavery on a stronger legal footing. But subsequent court cases tended to confirm Holt's earlier judgments. Having studied the law carefully, Granville Sharp published his book that weaved together case law and his own sense of Christian morality. He argued against the toleration of slavery, saying that if the English were to do so, we shall no longer deserve to be esteemed a civilised people. In the coming years, he looked for the case that could be brought to trial that would set the definitive precedent against the legality of slavery in Britain. It finally came in the form of an escaped slave, James Somerset, who called on Sharp before he was recaptured and had been about to be shipped to Jamaica. Sharp led the court case to have him freed, and the argument from the other side tried to sidestep arguments about the morality of slavery, focusing instead on economic impact to the nation if slavery were denied, not least because all of the slaves currently in the country would have to be freed at once. The judge, Lord Mansfield, did not want to make the definitive judgment Sharp was after. He was worried about the consequences. He kept putting off the judgment. Wasn't helped by the fact that at this point the country was on the brink of economic chaos from a banking crisis. The delay backfired on him because over time the case became the focus of huge amounts of public interest thanks to Sharp's campaigning amongst other things. Mansfield tried to produce a limited judgment but it's not how it was received in that febrile atmosphere. Noting that the owner, Charles Stewart, had kidnapped Somerset, he said that such an action was so high an act of dominion that it could only stand if such a right were recognised by the law of the country where it is used. The state of slavery is of such a nature that it is incapable of being introduced on any reasons, moral or political, but only by positive law and he ordered, therefore, that Somerset be discharged. The judgment was taken as granting freedom, not just to James Somerset, but to all black people in Britain. It's probably not what he meant, and it's not what, quite what it said. Didn't matter, de facto it was the result. In 1772, the slave owners asked Parliament to pass a positive act to legally recognise the holding of slaves. Parliament refused. Now that meant that slavery was not supported or recognised in Britain. It didn't stop the fact that Britain was a powerful force in the slave trade, preeminent, but the news spread fast across the Atlantic. In the American colonies, abolitionists celebrated, slave owners were outraged. When the American War of Independence came, there were slaves who fought on both sides, but certainly a good number of slaves fought for the British side, thinking that the king was their best hope of freedom. Some of those were betrayed by the British military who failed to honour their deal with some of them. Others were luckier and they were indeed transported to Britain to become free men. Unfortunately, as we've already noted, that often meant for freedom to become impoverished. In the aftermath of the war, Britain suddenly had a black poverty problem, a problem that was mingled with guilt, knowing that these were people that had fought for the country and had then been abandoned to their fate. Into this situation came a scam artist, one Henry Smeaveman. Needing to pay off his creditors, he came up with a scheme of shipping the impoverished blacks to a paradise part of Sierra Leone, which he knew personally, and he vouched to the authorities, would give the perfect environment to build a new community. Smeaveman did indeed know the area personally, and he'd given a very different testimony just a year earlier to a different parliamentary committee that had been looking at the settlement of convicts, where he'd described the area as a death trap. Smeaveman had hoped to set up a plantation with the labour of the people sent there to his own benefit. But he died before the journey. Unfortunately, his death did not lead to a reappraisal of the information given about the suitability of the site. So, full of hope, and with the active support of Granville Sharp, the first wave of settlers was sent, only to be devastated by disease and hostile climatic conditions. People did eventually settle there, when they went in greater numbers from British Canada, and it became free town. But a lot of suffering happened in the process. In the meantime, the slave trade remained. 
half of all the Africans who were carried into slavery over the course of the 18th century were transported in British ships. And to most people, it seemed that there was just no way out. Britain was addicted to slave-produced products. Its economy depended on them. Too much money, too much political power was invested in it. It just seemed impossible to take it on. But the fact that the majority of people knew very little about the reality of slavery, because it happened somewhere else, that was actually the weak underbelly of the beast. It meant people could still be shocked by it when they were brought face to face with it. And a number of things happened that made it more visible. One was the fate of the Zong, a British registered ship with 442 slaves on board, way more than it was built to carry. It tried to recover from a series of baffling navigational blunders by systematically choosing which slaves to throw overboard. They then tried to claim insurance against the loss of the ones that they themselves had killed. The case sparked popular outrage and a much higher level of awareness of the brutal conditions that slaves were transported in. In 1787, the abolitionist movement was born. Twelve men founded it, including the pottery entrepreneur Josiah Wedgwood, Thomas Clarkson and, of course, Granville Sharp. William Wilberforce MP worked tirelessly on the issue, as well as the philosopher and MP Edmund Burke. Over time, it became a mass movement, particularly supported by the autobiographies and campaigning of former slaves, who started to become celebrities in their own right, such as Alauda Equiano and Otoba Cuguono. One step led to another, first the Dolben Act in 1788, which reformed the conditions that slaves could be subjected to on transport ships, and then Wilberforce began introducing bills to Parliament to abolish the trade outright. The bills failed, but he kept bringing them back, and the support grew a bit more and a bit more over time. In 1805, another bill was defeated, but this time by a narrow margin, and the political mood had really begun to shift. The election of 1806 saw a new generation coming into Parliament, and the abolition bill was finally passed in 1807. The slave trade was abolished, and British warships no longer accompanied slave ships to defend them from attack, but instead were sent to the Atlantic to hunt down the slavers and to free their captives. It didn't end slavery, just for trade, and that was to come. After a small and limited slave rebellion in Jamaica was met by a brutal and completely disproportionate massacre by the government, it was arguably the atrocity that tipped the scales. The slave owners themselves began to accept the practice was doomed and ultimately it came to pass because of pragmatic compromise. In order to get the final abolition bill through Parliament, it was agreed that slave owners would be compensated, a fact that some find outrageous today. And indeed, some agreed that it was outrageous at the time. But the bill wouldn't have passed if that compromise hadn't been made. So the enduring question in politics, do you accept the messy compromise in the name of getting it done? Should they have demanded no compromise for the satisfaction of going down to glorious defeat while slavery continued? These questions are never very satisfying for anybody. Now, the history doesn't stop there, of course. You can't do a subject like this justice in a half hour video. Let me finish though with a few reflections. Some of it comes down to where you put your focus. Slavery has been routine through most of human history, in all early societies and all races. When the 1840 Convention on Slavery took place, they not only talked about Britain and America, but the slavery of the Ottoman Empire, the role of Islamic slave traders in the plight of Africans, Millions of people held in slavery in India, the serfdom that was rampant in Russia, and so on. The enslavement of others was a standard part of human behaviour for way more of our history than it has been absent. Almost all people take the standards of their time without question. Indeed, there are even examples of slaves being freed and then going on to hold slaves themselves. So it's not just a case of one community doing a universally reviled thing to another community. You have to deal with the fact that that was normal if you're going to understand the phenomenon. Why was Britain the one leading the charge to abolition? 
partly because the Enlightenment matched with the Industrial Revolution brought about a significant change of moral expectation, which eventually swept away other evils as well, such as child labour, which was also accepted as normal at the time, partly because slavery was not normalised in British society, so the public could be scandalised by it, once you've seen the real face of something and it's become normalised, it's become a standard part of life, it's much harder to get that momentum for change, as America found. In my view, it was also because the industrial age that Britain led took an everyday reality and applied industrial logic to it. And then it became many times more disgusting when we saw what it looked like at scale. In the same way that people have persecuted minorities and killed them through history. But it was only when it was done on an industrial scale in Germany in the mid-1940s that we decided that it represented the face of true evil. So it was with the slave trade. We became uniquely horrified by it because we became uniquely good at it. And it made the evil of the act impossible to ignore. For all those reasons, I look back on all of this as a process. People seeking to weaponise the past, usually doing it in order to give themselves power in the present. If you want to focus on an aspect of history, I'd be inclined to think that the real exceptional moment was when we decided to break the pattern and to conclude that we'd evolved to the point where we no longer held it to be acceptable to enslave another human being. Because it was the first time in history that had happened. In the decades immediately afterwards, pride amongst the people of Britain that they had been the first to abolish the practice was widespread. It seems a shame that so little of that pride seems to be injected into how the issue has been discussed in recent years. It's a choice what you decide to focus on. The thing that struck me the most looking at all of this, in the early history We didn't see people as black or white. We saw them as being individuals with a more nuanced identity. Black and white was introduced by the slave trade because it served their interests. Martin Luther King's dream of judging people by the content of a character, not by the colour of their skin, wasn't some idealistic projection of a future state. It was really a description of where we'd come from and surely, therefore, where we should be able to return. Arguably, we've lost our way on that journey, since everything now is held to be about race and so little to be about character. For people who stood against the norms of their time to abolish slavery had character in spades, as did the ex-slaves who stood with them, some of the subsequent civil rights campaigners who came after them. The history of slavery should teach us to celebrate such character, not to accept the status quos of today that divide people on the basis of their skin colour and attribute virtue or sin to them accordingly. I would argue that the people today talking about slavery the most seem to have absorbed its lessons the least. At least that will be a discussion worth having. (laughs) 